A man who lived a simple life caring for those that needed him the most. With hands soft as silk, he protected the jars persecuted for their materials. But it is impossible to be everywhere at all times. Having lost those he calls friends and family, he now only has a single purpose. Revenge. Please, allow me to introduce you to Potentate the Jarbarian, an aggressive melee-type quality build that focuses on both strength and dexterity. His weapons are his own hands, and the memories of those he lost wreath in flame and lightning. This is a build perfect for those players that want to be constantly on the attack without worrying about defense. Pain is the objective, and recklessness is the tool. As always, we will review the stats of this build, the equipment that we use, and of course, its applications within the game. Since there is a lot of ground to cover, I have created timestamps in the description of this video in order to make it easier to navigate the content and give you the opportunity to skip straight to the part that interests you the most. Let's get started. This is a PvE-focused build that works well in both solo and jolly cooperation. I will be honest, this build started out as a joke, but it very quickly turned into a monster. First and foremost, this build allows you to use every weapon in the game that does not have any requirements in Intelligence, Faith, or Arcane. If it only requires a physical stat, this build can use it. This creates an engine of endless possibilities and playstyles. You can be whatever you want to be. As for me, I decided to combine the speed of fist weapons with the full optimization of pot consumable items. This build has access to bleed for priority mobs as well as to fire and lightning type damages in order to take advantage of every enemy's weakness. But do not be confused. This build is also fully capable of taking multiple hits in order to come out victorious out of every slugfest. Capable of both single target elimination as well as AoE carnage, this build is a specialist at throwing hands and pots. To reach this objective, we will be running the following stats. Start the game as a Vagabond. This class is the most efficient to reach the required stat block for this build, allowing us to make use of every rune level possible to its maximum potential. As the primary focus of this build is PvE, I have chosen to base it on rune level 150. Finally, this is the stats blocks that you want to end up with. 60 Vigor, 20 Mind, 11 Endurance, 55 Strength, 55 Dexterity, 9 Intelligence, 12 Faith, and 7 Arcane. There are many ways to reach these stats. Level up however you feel comfortable. That said, I do recommend that you take the following path. As soon as you are in the lands between, the first thing to do is get your vigor to 20. Survivability is more important than damage when you're just starting out a character. The second priority is to get the character's basic tools ready. This means taking your strength to 18, your dexterity to 17, and your faith to 12. This will let you use the Bloodhound's Fang, which will be the carry weapon of this character. And also, use some basic support incantations that will make your life easier. For your third priority, bring your Dexterity to 30. This will give you a very healthy damage boost to the Bloodhound's Fang, and also give you the possibility of trying out other weapons if you desire. Now, it's time to bulk up, and your fourth priority is Vigor to 40. This will allow you to survive comfortably throughout the mid-game, allowing you to focus on your other stats. The fifth priority is to get Strength to 30. This will further increase the damage of Bloodhound's Fang and give you even more options for different weapons to try. By now, you should have 30 Strength and 30 Dexterity, giving you the power of quality and access to many different weapons. The sixth priority is to get Mind to 20. This will boost your FP to a comfortable level that will let you use a few Ashes of War as well as let you cast your support incantations multiple times. The seventh priority is to top off Vigor at 60. This will put you at our required HP pool, granting you maximum security to withstand the hardest hitting attacks from the endgame enemies. Next up, we turn our attention to full damage and we bring our Dexterity to 55. This is the second soft cap of the skill, letting you use most dex weapons in the game and maximizing your scaling. 
For your ninth and final priority, we round out the damage of the build by leveling up strength to 55. This will help you access most strength weapons in the game. It will give you a serious boost to your damage and open up all of your weapon options. You are now in full quality status. You can shape this build to be whatever you want it to be. So, why do we want these final stats? Allow me to explain. Vigor at 60 because I believe it is the perfect amount of health to survive the hardest hitting attacks of PvE. This will give us the total of 1,900 base HP. It is the second cap for the stat. Going any higher really diminishes your returns, and honestly, I would never go any lower. Mind that 20 because this build does not focus on heavy spell or Ash of War uses. We will be running a lot of buffs, and they do not cost a lot of FP. I try to keep this at a minimum investment while still providing the character with some options. Endurance at 11 because it is the base level of the Vagabond. Due to my choices in equipment, it is more than enough to keep a medium load. Not only this, but there is plenty of equipment left over to give you the chance to experiment. Because that's the power of quality, trying different things. Strength at 55 because it is one of the primary damage stats of the build. It controls our weapon requirements as well as the damage from weapon scaling. Dexterity at 55 because it is the other primary damage stat of the build. It controls our weapon requirements as well as the damage from weapon scaling. Intelligence at 9 because it is the base level of the Vagabond. We do not increase it at all in this build. Faith at 12 because it is the minimum that we need in order to take advantage of some key incantations that bring a lot of support to the build. The amount of benefit we get from this is very much worth the small investment. Finally, Arcane at 7 because it is the base level of the Vagabond. We do not increase it at all in this build. Moving on to the equipment, this is the basic layout of the build. As mentioned before, you can make this build into whatever you want it to be. As for myself, I wanted to experiment with consumable items and establish a very aggressive and reckless playstyle. In the main hand, I like to use a quality star fist with the golden bow Ash of War. I will be honest, I chose this weapon because it looks like a set of pots with spikes. Not only is this exceedingly metal, but it also fits the theme of the build fantastically. The star fist has an innate bleed effect and, thanks to the quality infusion, we can use blood grease to increase this even further. When we combine this with the fast attack speed of fist type weapons, we get a shredding machine capable of getting multiple bleed procs very easily. I imagine that it would be scary seeing a man with a pot on his head running at you to punch you with spiked metal pots. And that is exactly the feel that I'm going for. I like to use the Golden Bow Ash of War with this build because not only does it increase our attack and defense, but this increase also applies to our consumable items as well. Indeed, Golden Bow also increases the damage that our throwing pots will do. And we like that. In the offhand, I use two armaments. The Quality Iron Ball and the Frenzied Flame Seal. Starting with the Iron Ball, this weapon serves two purposes. First of all, once again, the weapon looks like they are two pots. And this build loves everything that is pots. Not only this, but when using the Star Fist with both hands to beat up enemies, the character model puts each of the pot-looking iron balls at his waist. It honestly looks like there are two additional pots strapped to your belt and I simply cannot get over how much this fits the look of the build. The second reason why I like to use this weapon in my offhand, besides accessorizing the Elden Bling, is that I like to use the Sacred Order Ash of War on it. This Ash of War not only increases our weapon damage by 10%, but it also increases the damage that undead enemies take by another 100%. That is right, this Ash of War straight up doubles the damage that we deal to undead. Furthermore, it immediately kills the undead and there is no need to double tap them. When the death right birds pop in or a bunch of skeletons show up, the Iron Ball gets the job done. The second and final armament in our offhand is the Frenzied Flame Seal. This seal is perfect for this build because it has no stat requirements and no weight. 
This means that we can use it to cast our basic support incantations without having to worry about incantation scaling or increasing our equip burden. Having access to specific incantations to increase our defenses and deal with very specific problems is very useful, and having it accessible without it affecting our weight ratios is extremely powerful. The objective of this build is to rush your enemy down with fast punches that apply bleed while dealing ranged damage to small groups of targets with your many different pot consumables. It is a fast playstyle that requires a lot of knowledge and item transitions, and I believe that this equipment gets the job done and lets you look cool while doing it. With our weapons out of the way, let's talk about talismans. This build has very simple objectives when it comes to talisman. We want survivability and we want more damage for our throwing pots. For this reason, we are running the Earth Tree Favor Plus 2, the Crimson Amber Medallion Plus 2, and the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman to be able to maximize our defensive potential. These three talismans give us a total of 2,134 HP with a very reliable 31% physical damage absorption. With our defensive power taken care of, we rely on the Companion Jar to maximize the damage potential of all the throwing pot items that we use. The Companion Jar increases the damage of our pots by 20%, and this stacks multiplicatively with the 15% we get from the Jar Helmet, for a total of 38% more damage on all our throwing pot consumables. This is very good. With this talisman combination, we guarantee maximum damage on our ranged options while increasing our HP and defense for those situations where we need to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with large enemies. The Jar Varian is capable of both taking damage and inflicting it with great efficiency. Alright then, let's talk about armor. In this game, armor is extremely important. This is because this game has extremely good looking armor. Fashion Souls, or Elden Bling, however you prefer to call it, is at an all-time high. For this build, I wanted to create the Jarbarian, and this meant a bare-chested muscle machine of destruction. To reach this look, I used the Jar Helmet, No Chest Armor, the Blood-Soaked Manchette, and the Elden Lord Greaves. Remember, this is not a trained warrior. This is an instinct-driven beast that only knows jars and pots, comfy boots, short shorts, and no shirt for maximum mobility, and of course, carefully wrapped hands in order to protect their softness. Don't forget, this character is the potentate, and we cannot allow calluses on those hands. This armor setup provides 13% physical damage reduction on its own, that turns into 31% physical damage reduction with the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman. As for poise, this fashion only provides 15 points of it. Obviously, we will not be tanking any hits wearing this armor. Furthermore, the Jar Helmet increases the damage that our pot consumables deal by 15%. As we went over before, this stacks multiplicatively with the 20% from the Companion Jar Talisman, for a total of 38% additional pot damage on our consumables. I definitely went full Fashion Souls with this setup, looking to follow the lore of the character. Next up, I want to go over the consumables and summon that are basic to increase this build's power. Let's start with the consumables. First of all, I like to use Boiled Prawns to increase my defense, Blood Grease to increase my bleed potential, and the Iron Jar Aromatic for those situations when I need to overpower a particularly difficult enemy. That said, these are all optional and you can use whatever others you want. Now, my dear viewer, I want to make something clear. In this build, I am using the Boiled Prawn because, unfortunately, I killed Blackguard before he moved on to the capital. This means that his inventory did not upgrade to the Boiled Crab. This was my mistake, but if you have access to it, use the Boiled Crab. It is 100% better in every case and it has no downsides. Moving on. The most important consumables are the ones that you see on your screen. The pots. I like to use four kinds of pots. Fire pots, lightning pots, red main fire pots, and ancient dragon bolt pots. 
The fire pots and the red main fire pots provide fire type damage and they scale with strength. On the other hand, lightning pots and ancient dragon bolt pots provide lightning type damage and scale with dexterity. As you can see, this covers two damage options and different scaling that works perfectly with a quality type build. These are your main sources of range damage and thanks to all the different buffs that they received, they can reach really good damage numbers. If you counter enemy weaknesses and pay attention to your environment, you will have very strong options for large amounts of damage. These are your bread and butter. Do not hesitate to use them. The build spends a lot of resources to increase the potential of these items and it would all go to waste if you keep them in your pocket. Throw the pots. We can always craft more. As for the spirit summon, there really is only one choice, and that is the Mimic. As we all know, the Mimic provides an exact copy of our build when we summon it. This includes weapons and armor, but most importantly, it also copies all of the items that you have equipped to your belt. That is right, the Mimic also has access to all of the consumable items that we equipped. And even better, the Mimic has an unlimited number of them. When fighting, the Mimic will be throwing pots at enemies and using the Iron Jar Automatic to become a slow-moving, death-dealing machine. This makes it a perfect tank, but also a really good source of damage. The Mimic's pot will do as much damage as ours because the Mimic has the same equipment that buffs them. On top of all of this, the Mimic can also make use of the Golden Bow Ash of War to increase your damage, as well as help with additional bleed proc. This is the perfect summon for this build because it is a direct increase of damage to everything that we do. Whether it is punching things, bleeding things, buffing us, or throwing pots, the Mimic will always be providing some sort of support. We have no control on what this summon will do, so we make sure that anything it does is extremely helpful to us. Up to this point, we have spoken about the equipment and the armor. We have talked about offense and defense. Up next, we will cover the incantations that we will use to increase our power. Like we went over when talking about the stats, this build runs a simple 12 points of faith in order to take advantage of some basic support incantations that go a long way into making this build much, much stronger. For this, there are two important things to keep in mind. First, spell choice is personal. I will be showing you the list that I like to use with this build, but be sure to make the additions or the changes that you feel are needed for your experience. Second, there is a lot of power that we can get from just 12 faith. A lot of incantations have low requirements and they provide a lot of support to all builds. If you're interested in knowing just how much power we get from 12 Faith, I will leave a link in the description to another guide that explains this subject matter. Do not hesitate to check it out. With nothing further to add, let me show you the incantations that I like to use. There are six spells that I will always run, no matter what, on a character with just 12 Faith. The list is as follows. Flame Cleanse Me. Heal. Magic Fortification, Flame Fortification, Lightning Fortification, and Divine Fortification. First is Flame Cleanse Me. This is one of the most powerful incantations in the game. It provides a fast, cheap way to get rid of poison and, most importantly, Scarlet Rot. This should always be in your list of spells. At only 12 faith requirement, it is too good to pass up and there is no reason to not use it in every build that you make. Second, we have the Resistance Crew. The Quartet of Magic Fortification, Flame Fortification, Lightning Fortification, and Divine Fortification is our main tool to counterpick the damage that each of the game's enemies and bosses will do. They provide resistance to magic, fire, lightning, and holy damage, respectively. You should always have one of these active if you want to increase your chances of survival. Each of these incantations will leave you with around 42 to 43% absorption against the chosen type, depending on what kind of armor you choose to use. Mileage may vary, but it is always a good choice to have this on. 
It is very important to know what you're up against so that you can help yourself survive the battle. Finally, heal. This incantation is the only healing spell that I use. That said, due to the low incantation scaling of our seal, it does not really heal very well. Fortunately, we do not need to use this spell to recover health. In fact, I use this spell for one thing and one thing only. To kill Revenant. Revenants are one of the most powerful and annoying non-boss type enemies that you can find in the game. They deal incredible amounts of damage and are in constant motion and attack. They teleport around the area and I am sure you know have that one stupid move where they hit you one million times with all of their limbs in succession. It is very difficult to fight them, but fortunately if you do not let them get started on their offense they become much easier. In order to achieve this, we use heal. Revenants are very weak to holy damage, but also they are extremely weak to healing spells. If you cast a healing spell with an AoE and it catches the revenant, they will take damage instead of being healed. The amount of damage they take is always the same, about 60% of their total HP. Two spells will always kill them, and since the first spell also staggers them, it is very easy to cast two of them back to back for the kill. Since the damage is always the same, I like to use heal because it costs the least amount of FP out of all the AoE heals. If you execute this strategy correctly, then you will defeat the Revenant before it even has a chance to hit you. By now, my dear viewer, I am sure you have noticed that between Ashes of War, Consumables and Incantations, this build runs a lot of buffs. And it is true. I made this build taking into consideration that there are many different ways to increase our power through buffs, especially the power of our pots. On your screen, you are now seeing all of the buffs that this build can take advantage of. The Golden Bow, Ash of War, the different fortification incantations, the Boiled Prawn, Blood Grease, and the Sacred Order, Ash of War. Please remember, I am using the Boiled Prawn in this character because I made a mistake and locked myself out of boiled crabs. If you have access to the crabs, use them. They are a direct upgrade. The Golden Bow Ash of War lasts for 45 seconds and gives us an 11.5% AR boost with a 7.5% physical absorption boost. The different fortification incantations last for 90 seconds and offer a 35% boost to the non-physical absorption of the corresponding spell. The Boiled Prong lasts for 60 seconds and gives us a 15% physical absorption boost. If you have access to the Crab, it's a 20% boost for the same duration. Blood Grease adds a total of 30 units of bleed proc on our weapons and it lasts 60 seconds. Finally, the Sacred Order Ash of War lasts for 30 seconds and it gives us a 10% AR boost with an additional 100% boost versus Undead. Now, let's organize these buffs in the different groups. In Elden Ring, there are weapon buffs, body buffs, and aura buffs. You can only have one buff active from each group. When the time comes to stack your buffs, you can only pick one from each group to activate at the same time. As you can see, we cannot stack the Boiled Prawn with the fortifications, because they are both body buffs, and we cannot stack Blood Grease with Sacred Order, because they are both weapon buffs. With this information, we can determine the following stacks that you can use depending on your situation and what you're looking for. What you are now seeing is the different stacks of buffs that we have available with this build. Depending on your situation, you activate one or the other. The main determining factor is whether the enemy that you will be fighting is susceptible to bleed or not. If they are, use the stacks on the left, and if they are not, use the stacks on the right. In the same way, if you are fighting undead enemies, definitely use the stacks on the right, as they will double your damage. After that, you will either use the Boiled Prawn or the corresponding Fortification Incantation, depending on whether you need more Physical Defense or more Elemental Defense. At the bottom of each stack, you will find the full effects of all of these buffs activated together. As you can see, 
this build is fully capable of countering any enemy in the game as long as you have the knowledge. One last note, please use the buffs in the order that you see them, from top to bottom. You probably noticed that we are casting the ones with a longer duration first and the ones with a shorter duration last. This will help us keep the full stack for as long as possible. As we have seen, this build makes heavy use of some throwing pot consumables and we spend multiple resources in increasing the potency and efficiency of these items. The good thing about these consumables is that they don't require any FP or have any kind of condition to use. All we have to do is craft them and use them. That being said, and this is the worst part of the build, in order to craft the different pots that we use, we need the materials. Some materials are easy to farm, while others not so much. This is the next step in the guide, understanding what materials we need and where to get them. My dear viewer, please understand that I will be showing you the different ways that I farm for these materials. That does not mean that they are the best way to do it. I will show you what I do, and then you decide if it works for you. As we saw earlier in the video, this build uses fire pots, lightning pots, red main fire pots, and ancient dragon bolt pots. In order to craft all of these pots, we need the following materials. Mushrooms, smoldering butterflies, fulgor bloom, old fangs, and gravel stones. Let's take a look at where we can get them. Starting with the mushrooms, I like to farm these at the village of the Alvinorex. You will find this site of grace to the southwest of Leornia of the Lakes. From this site of grace, you can use torrent in order to get the mushrooms that spawn at the foot of a nearby tree, and then one near the grace. Each of these spawns can generate one or two mushrooms. Since there are three pickups, each round will give you between three to six mushrooms. Each run takes about 15 seconds, meaning that this farm spot gives you an average of one mushroom every three seconds. Next up, the smoldering butterflies. I like to farm these at the Ravine Veiled Village Site of Grace, located to the north of Leorni of the Lakes and bordering with the Altus Plateau. Immediately next to this grace, there is a bonfire with a single smoldering butterfly pickup. You can get up from the grace, take a few steps, get the pickup, take a few steps back to the grace and sit down. It is an extremely easy farming spot that requires zero brain power. The pickup gives you either one or two smoldering butterflies, and it takes about four seconds to do a run, due to the animations when you sit at the grace. Again, this averages to about one smoldering butterfly every three seconds, and I cannot stress enough how easy it is to do it. I have done this so many times that I no longer need to look at the screen to be successful. Since we are using lightning pots, we are going to need bulgur blooms. You can find them in multiple locations where lightning strikes the grass. Personally, I like to farm these near the Castle Soul main gate, Site of Grace, located to the north of the mountain tops of the Giants. From this Site of Grace, right torrent towards the west, and you will hear and see the lightning strike in the ground. There are about 12 pickups at this location. Each pickup will give you either one or two fulgor blooms, and the full run takes about 40 seconds. This means that you can average about one fulgor bloom every 2.5 seconds. That's a pretty good rate. When making the big fire pots, we need old fangs, and this is a bit more tedious to farm. I like to get old fangs at the Castle Morn Lift Grace, located to the south of the Weeping Peninsula. From this site of grace, take the elevator up to Castle Morn, and in the first courtyard, you will find about eight misbegotten. Each of them has a 5% chance of dropping one old fang. From here, it is pure luck. Make sure that you increase your character's discovery in order to improve your chances and keep killing the misbegotten until you have as many old fangs as you need. Each run takes about 55 seconds, and the amount of old fangs you get per run is completely based on RNG. Most times, you will finish the run and not get any of them. On a side note, 
there are a few smoldering butterfly pickups around this courtyard, so it's also a nice bonus while you're looking for the fan. The last material that we need to farm for is the gravel stone. This is also very tedious to farm and it fills my life with suffering. I like to farm gravel stones at the Dragon Temple Lift site of Grace, located at Faramazula. From this Grace, follow the path you see on screen until you reach the dragon to the south. Next, fight and defeat this dragon. When you are successful, this dragon will drop three gravel stones guaranteed each and every time. With this build, I was able to defeat the dragon in under 5 minutes, but I do not recommend using fist weapons against it. In fact, I recommend some kind of bleed-based curve source for additional hits and damage. With some practice, I was able to get the dragon in under 3 minutes each time, meaning that I was getting one gravel stone every minute. They are guaranteed, but that does not make it any less painful. There's only one last thing that I want to go over in this guide, and that is just how much damage we can get the pots to do. I will tell you right now, it is a lot of damage. I was honestly surprised. For something that is quote unquote easy to make, they sure provide some really impressive damage. On your screen, you are seeing all of the tools that we use to increase the power of our throwing pot consumables. All in all, we get a 15% damage increase from the jar helmet a 20% damage increase from the Companion Jar Talisman, a 20% damage increase from our Flask of Physics as we are using the Flame Shrouding Crack Tier and the Lightning Shrouding Crack Tier, and finally, an additional 11.5% damage boost from the Golden Bow Ash of War. All of these damage increases work together multiplicatively. This means that they are not added together, and instead they are multiplied into each other. And so, the result is a grand total of 84.6% additional throwing pot damage with this setup. That is an immense damage boost, almost doubling our initial damage output. It is important to understand that in Elden Ring, throwing pot consumables scale with our stats. Fire pots scale with strength, and lightning pots scale with dexterity. Since we are running a quality build, both our strength and our dexterity are high, and that means that the base damage of our throwing pots is also high. Once we add the incredible 84.6% damage boost, we can obtain very impressive damage numbers. For example, you can see here that one ancient Dragon Bolt pot deals over 1,300 damage on an omen from the Lane del Sewers. These enemies are quite strong and very tanky, yet we were able to remove 20% of their HP with a single consumable item that we can replace as soon as the battle ends. I mentioned it before throughout the video, it was not my intention to make this into a serious build. I just wanted to experiment and see the potential of the throwing pot consumables in Elden Ring. It is safe to say that I am impressed, and I believe that these pots not only have potential, but they also have true power. The amount of damage that we can get is considerable, and it definitely makes it worthwhile to use with this build. That being said, and I have to be honest, while this build is very powerful, I do not believe it is very useful. Relying so much on these consumables means that we will be prisoners of the crafting materials, spending hours of our time farming for them in order to make more pots. That is a huge setback because it adds an extra condition to the build that is very difficult to accept. Nevertheless, this is one of the most fun builds I have ever made. Jumping around, punching enemies and throwing pots with a half-naked character wearing a jar on its head is just too much fun especially in co-op. It might look like a joke at first, but no one should be laughing at the Jarbarian. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope that I get to see you on the next one.